Um, I have the privilege of sitting as the Ngāi representative on the board of Te Taumata, and it is my privilege now to um, introduce the next speaker. Um, Juan Tauri is a Ngāti Pro social activist and senior lecturer in criminology at the University of Waikato. Juan is a critical commentator on a range of social and policy issues, including state responses to Indigenous critique of crime control policies and interventions, the prison industrial complex and its impact on Indigenous peoples, the impact of institutional research ethics, processes on Indigenous-led research, and the politics of policy development in settler colonial context. No mean feat. He's also known um, as the Indigenous criminologist. Um, and I thought that was quite, um, I might say, it, it was very, um, clinical in terms of that introduction, so I thought I would stalk one. So I uh, went to Google. So I'm going to read some things that I've found out. I hope, one, that, um, that Google have got this right, and if I say anything that is incorrect, you can, you can blame them. So um, Juan has been widely published, and I found out since about 1998, uh, according to what I found in terms of the earliest piece of work that he did, and brings a wealth of knowledge to the area of criminology and the justice sector, an area we know where so much more work is needed to both understand the drivers and change the culture of a system that continues to further damage and disadvantage our whanau, who enter it at any level. And this has been evidenced by some of uh, Juan's recent work in the area of DNA, and he was also a joint author on uh, a piece of work called Stigmata or that related to stigmatising gang narratives and social policing of Māori women. In, 19, uh, in 2016, he co-authored a book called um, Indigenous Criminology, and it was the first book to comprehensively explore Indigenous people's content context, sorry, with criminal justice systems in a contemporary and historical context, drawing on a comparative indigenous, drawing on comparative indigenous material from North America, Australia and Aotearoa. It addresses both the theoretical underpinnings to the development of a specific indigenous criminology and canvases the broader policy and practice implications for criminal justice. It argues for the importance of indigenous knowledge and methodology to criminology and suggests colonialism needs to be a fundamental con concept in criminology in order to understand contemporary problems such as deaths in custody, high imprisonment rates, police brutality and the high levels of violence in some indigenous communities. Prioritising the voices of Indigenous people will make a significant and will make a significant contribution to the development of decolonising criminology. I look forward to hearing the presentation that we're about to hear. Kia ora. I almost didn't recognise that person that she was uh, describing. Kia ora everyone. Kia ora whanau. Francis, you want to know what real pressure is? Speaking after you, and, uh, and kia ora is, is pressure. I have never been uh, so prepared for a talk like this in my whole life. Uh, from my presentation, uh, that's, yeah, to, uh, to the amount of time I've spent on my, on my talk. Um, I get, as an academic, I get invited to speak often at uh, conferences with all the theoreticians and not the practitioners. So I'm really uh, humbled and privileged to be, have been asked to come here, not only to speak, but more importantly for me as an academic and researcher to actually listen and learn uh, from those who actually do the mahi on the ground. Uh, and it is quite different from the academic conferences where there's usually a, me in a room with four other people who do the same work. Uh, and we talk about a wonderful publication that only six people will ever read. <laughs> Four of them being our mates and the other one our mum, <laughs> who, who thinks it's rubbish but says, oh darling, I'm very proud of that paper. <laughs> so uh, I was very privileged and humbled and I thought, yeah, I've got this, it's no problem, I, I know what I'm going to do. And then I looked at the, um, the programme and then I uh, went in and to my partner Christina, who I think probably is watching, so I'm going to embarrass her. And uh, so I said to her, uh, darling, yeah, I'm going to talk about these things. 
as you do. And she gave me the just right amount of attention before her eyes glazed over. <laughs> and then I said, oh, and talking before me are the Casketeers. The Casketeers. Because she's, and she's asked me to say to you, she's your one, number one fan. <laughs> and I, the instruction she gave me wasn't have a good time, good luck dear, get a selfie. With <laughs> No interest at all in what I'm doing. Uh, yeah, it's like, yeah, darling, whatever. Casket Oh my God, she never misses it. Anyway, and wonderful presentation. And I, I honestly don't know how I'm going to follow this up. Anyway, um, oh yeah, the photo. Please explain. When I arrived yesterday, I don't use PowerPoint for presentations like this. Uh, and um, I, one of the organisers said, "Do you have something?" I said, "What do you mean?" He said, "Well, if we don't have something to put up, then it's just going to be blank or your name, which no one's going to want to look at for long." And so I went back to the hotel yesterday and I went through my laptop and all I have really are about 200 photos of my children. So I thought, well, this is Fano water. It's all about Fano. So there's two reasons. One is that there's not a blank space. So that's that cheeky thing in the middle. Typical boy is my son, uh, Ruben, Matua, Michael. And next to him is uh, my Nati Pro warrior princess. Okay, Isabella Ruby. Isabella. The name came from, I love history, my, one of my most favorite hist historical figures, Isabella of Castile, Queen of, uh, Queen of Spain, who along with her husband in the 15th century, for, uh, Ferdinand, no, sorry, Francis, Francis fought a number of wars against the Moors and the French and united Spain as one country. And she did something that was unusual for a female sovereign at the time. She actually led her armies in armor. So I thought that was a pretty cool name to give my Nati Pado daughter. And she's turned out, as I hoped and expected, staunch, uh, and likes to ring up Dad to give me lectures on my toxic masculinity. <laughs> the second reason why I wanted this photo here is because this, they are the reason why I do the work that I do, which is not always pleasant work in dealing with, with the violence that the state often perpetrates against indigenous communities, and, it's, and including Māori. But I want to do this work to hopefully make even, even a minute uh, amount of difference in the way we develop crime control policy and interventions in New Zealand, so that my children do not have to suffer the violence that has been perpetrated against Māori communities for generations, which in my view, as a critical criminologist, and at least in part explains our over significant overrepresentation, okay, in the criminal justice system as it stands. Uh, the title of my talk is, uh, If You Are So Good, Why Is Your Policy So Bad? That's the first part. Uh, and if you're wondering, that actually came from, uh, that, those, those words were spoken by Kuya at uh, uh, Corrections Hui in Invercargill in 2001 that I had been invited to go down uh, at Tapuni Kōkiri as an official to, to um, observe. And the corrections, of course, went through the usual 50-minute hard sell about how wonderful they were, how good they, their outcomes were for Māori, and any questions, and this queer got up and bang, that was the statement, and I just thought it was the best thing that I'd heard. <laughs> well, yeah, all right? And, but I've actually heard that type of sentiment and comment so many times in my 25 years or more, either working as a, an academic researcher as an activist, and even as 10 years in policy. So many uh, Māori service providers, ex and current offenders and inmates, um, and even a few policy workers have made this particular point to me. Okay? And I think it's a phrase that powerfully frames you know, the focus and content of my kōrero to you today, because I think that it invokes a fundamental tension. And that tension is, on the one hand, we have the rhetoric and the ideology that the crime, criminal justice policy sector often uses okay, uh, to demonstrate uh, how good it is, and then up at that and attention in relation to the reality, the impact that their activity has on the everyday lives of individual Māori on our whānau, hapū and iwi. Okay? That tension emanates from uh, the industry, uh, sorry, the criminal justice sector, I call them sometimes the policy industry, sorry their continuous exaggeration of the efficacy or positive impact of their business against, against us, okay, against the evidence of decades of catastrophic failure of their approach to social harm, especially for Māori. 
Okay, and that catastrophic failure is evidenced in the continued significant overrepresentation of Māori in the system. And they do have a part to play in that. If you listen to the criminal justice sector, police, corrections, Minister of Justice, Oranga Tamariki, they're part of the process as well. Predominantly, the focus is on what's wrong with us. And that has to be part of the equation, yes? Individual proclivity, mental health issues, drug and alcohol addiction, that impacts individuals and whanau. But we must look at the historical context and the contemporary context in terms of the actual practice of criminal justice itself and the role that it plays, yeah? So, we're in 2021. This marks 30 years since the publication of Moana Jackson's groundbreaking exploration of our experience of crime control in Aotearoa, Māori and the criminal justice system here, Whaipanga Ho. And that dialogue, I don't call it research, it was a dialogue and a conversation was took place between Moana and his research team and 3,000 Māori participants, okay, from a range of occupations and experiences of criminal justice, right? And what he reported in that groundbreaking report, which has never been replicated until, I wonder if he's, oh, hopefully he's not watching. Hey, I've, heard, I've heard a rumour he's replicated that research and it will be released soon. Yeah, exactly. It's going to be wonderful. Anyway, what did he find? Well, he actually found a number of things that I think are, are, are significant issues for uh, that, for example, about the Māori criminal justice relationship, yeah? That actually resonates with the experiences of other indigenous peoples in other settler colonial jurisdictions such as Canada, Australia, etc. And there's three that I actually wanted to just mention now. What they found was evidence of the criminalisation of Māori through racialised, violent policing strategies and a biased Eurocentric policy process. You know, a policy process that, that seeks to silence the other. Two, he found the social economic dislocation driven by, sorry, significant social and economic dislocation and disenfranchisement of Māori, driven by the intergenerational impact of incarceration in a dehumanising and violent prison system. Three, he found, and uh, something that worries me as an academic, collusion between a white-streamed, dominated academy that I belong to and the policy industry in Wellington. This parasitic relationship was focused more on ensuring that these two groups attained hegemony or control over the knowledge production or the knowledge that is deemed suitable for the development of policy. Okay. And it does not generally include our knowledge. Okay, and the way in which we explain the world and especially how we seek to understand and respond to social harm. Okay. Sadly, 33 years on from the release of Miner's report, and I think little has changed about the way in which the criminal justice system goes about its work, apart from um, generally superficial cosmetic alterations to the business. I'm talking about things like prisons giving themselves Māori names and their programs, their strategies, uh, including some of our symbols on their, I don't know, in their buildings and what have you, right? Because of time, I'm going to focus on a couple of key themes I believe characterise the way in which the state in New Zealand, and particularly the policy sector, and my discipline of criminology, uh, has responded to two things. One is the ongoing overrepresentation of Māori in the criminal justice system, and the other is the Māori critique of crime control policy in New Zealand. Okay, that started in an academic form with Moana, the release of Moana's report, and has continued on since. Okay? Now, I'm, I'm going to say some mean things about the policy sector and the academy. Uh, if you're from that sector, it's not personal. Uh, Moana is kind of, an, I've known him since he taught me English at Wainuimata College in 1980, and, um, and uh, one of the things that he, so he's like an unofficial mentor, I just talk him as a mentor, he didn't actually agree, <laughs> but one of the things that I do, I've always appreciated, tried to live by is something that he instilled in me, which is to be fierce, and to tell the truth, as I, not only as I see it, but as it's told to me by, by um, my own people. I'm going to punctuate my discussion uh, of these themes by referring to findings. So I'm going to make this empirical. I'm going to, I'm going to base it on evidence. 
of findings from research on various aspects of the Māori criminal justice relationship. For example, a report by Otago Medical School in 2018 called They Are Our Whānau, Māori Perspectives of the, on the Justice System. They surveyed 1,000 Māori. Uh, Paora Moyle, who used to be a social worker for Oranga Tambariki many years ago, who research on Māori experiences of childcare protection and family group conferencing, and my own research in the recent last four years on Rangatahi and whānau experiences of policing in prison. So, to these themes or trends. Basically, the first trend, the way that the state has responded to our, our concerns and to our overrepresentation, isn't fundamental changes or alterations to the system or the practices itself. They're mainly superficial or what I call artificial, right? And they come under three headings, and I will explain them, and I'm sorry to get a bit, not theoretical, but, but um, academic -y. Okay, and one of the primary ways they've done it, I've already mentioned, which is indigenisation. And what that means is just m getting more brown people within the police force, for example, or working in policy, okay, and uh, indigenising our names, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So, and so that's an important driver, okay? Um, another is process is what we call co-option. And this is when the system goes in we critique it to say there's not enough Māori-ness about your interventions, about how you deal with rangatahi offenders, and they'll go, OK, uh, we've got a really cool psychotherapy uh, course, uh, we'll make it a blended programme. And the blending is that you can have a karakia at the beginning and end, and the rest of the programme is Eurocentric Western therapeutic uh, response. Yeah, that's what I, that's what I mean by co-option. Right, so they co-opt acceptable elements of tikanga and practice and allow us and allow us to practice that component but the, but the basis of the so-called therapy intervention is Pākehā, based on Pākehā theories of criminality, usually actually developed for a program in Wisconsin or Bristol in England or, and then imported here, all right? Um, yeah, I've got some, oh, examples, yeah, yeah. Now, I wasn't sure whether I was going to mention this one, but I will, because it might make me very unpopular. So we do have, like, for example, blended psychotherapeutic programs and, and corrections, right? The family group conferencing process. The much lauded, the, the, the one, we are, we're New Zealand, we are great importers of crime control policy. We import everything. We're not, we don't develop our own, the one exception is family group conferencing. And I fought for 20 years to fight the mythologising around that that forum as a Māori forum that is based on tikanga. It is not. It was based at the time in the late 1990s, nearly 2000s, on what was becoming a predominant concept and theory about how to turn young people around from offending, which was based in Great Britain and America, which was based on what we call the accountability principle. Hold them to account. The Family Good Conference was designed primarily to hold the individual to account. It was not designed to deal with the wider social issues that resulted in a young person making that decision to offend. All right? For it to be a truly, in my view, Māori programme, we would be less concerned, we, we'll get to the point of accountability, but we need to find out why they have committed that offence and all the factors that are involved, and then build a holistic uh, response that deals with the drivers of offending. Is that, would that you agree? That apparently is what FGCs do, but we know that the vast majority of the FGC plans, they deal with the accountability side, so that the young person could be shown to be held responsible, and the social development and support side, too expensive, doesn't get dealt with. Yeah? Go? Yeah, okay. Rangatahi courts. Yeah. Um, is, is, I'm not bagging it, I just need to report on some of the research I've done with Rangatahi lately in my conversations with Moana Jackson, his team have found the same thing. It is working, it is a good environment for some young Māori offenders, but not all of them. And a lot of the people that I've dealt with, the young people have said, um, basically, there's a number of issues. The Omurai process, many of them went, said to me, and Moana's team found the same, What's the difference? It's run like a formal court. Why is this a problem? Because now, and particularly these urbanised young Māori who have no, like me, no real, etc., etc., who have had little engagement with their elders, your kaumātua, now see the, the court, the, the marae, as a court. 
And their experience of the court, what they have a lot of experience of the court, has not been positive. So some of them are coming away with extremely negative views of their marae. And also their elders, which is obviously not fair, right? They, I won't mention, I won't actually, you know, I've got a quote here, but I won't say every word he said. But he was like, who are these old people who don't know me to judge me? They're no different from the judges, the Pākehā judges in court. And many of them have, have stated to me that they won't go back to the marae. They associate it with courts and crime control as part of the surveillance process that they've had to live under all their lives. Yeah? And the last kind of uh, way in which they've dealt with us in the, uh, is something called orientalization. And that's, again, an academic word. And what it means is, is that when the policy sector likes to import programs and then try to actually and say, these are going to be good for Māori, and we question it and say, well, where was it developed? Well, Wisconsin, Bristol. We go, well, how do you know it's going to be good for us? This is something we often hear. Well, you know, it works for black people. Now, hopefully Helen's laughing, because Helen Leahy even could have heard that, because I distinctly remember, Helen, by the way, was my boss at TPK, so it's all her fault. Um, <laughs> went to a meeting uh, in the early to mid-2000s, Corrections and Ministry of Social Development wanted to franchise multi-systemic therapy. Do you remember this, Helen? Right, yeah. And um, I went along, uh, you know, a number of us went along, Helen was there, and uh, they brought over a professor from America who was one of, who was one of the uh, de people that developed this. And he was talking about, we've made this wonderful discovery. What's that? An holistic approach to dealing with youth will deal with their, fa their family issues. We'll deal with their educational issues there. And we're sitting there going, no, 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 we invented that. Like, out, we've been taking a holistic approach in our social service delivery amongst Māori communities for like 50 years, you know. But they thought they'd invented this. And then Helen, if I remember rightly, the story goes, asked a question. How do you know that it works for Māori? Do you remember? You did. She doesn't, eh? And, this, and, this, he, and he looked at us and he goes, well, we've done research and it works for African-Americans. And it's like, well, we, we're kind of different. <laughs> yeah, we're subjugated people, but with very different histories, you know. Now, you're laughing, but this is a refrain, uh, a defence of this importation process of policy interventions that we have heard so many times. Right? Oh, it works, it works for Afro-Caribbeans in Bristol. You know, we're not the same. This is what we call orientalisation, meaning if they're brown, you're brown, it worked for everyone. Yeah? The second major trend, how much time do I have? Because I know I'm running out. Am I okay? And this I've, I've included because I think it's really topical now. The denial of the existence of racism and bias in the criminal justice system. Right? Wonderful timing. Okay, well, given what's been happening. And Jackson Moana's study highlighted the extent to which we experience racism and, and bias within the system itself. Yeah? In my own study, um, of rangatahi experience of policing uh, is also demonstrating or showing that there is still a significant problem, right? I'm just going to skip you. Perhaps one of the most really disconcerting things that I've found in my research is that a number of the, of the rangatahi that I've interviewed and also Moana's team talked extensively about their own experiences, yeah? But uh, they, what the... What the um, the whakamā and, and the anger that they, have, they expressed because of the experiences of their younger siblings, of bias, of aggressive and bullying behaviour by police that they have encountered. So for many of the rangatahi that I've researched the last four years, the experiences of their friends, their, their younger brothers and sisters and cousins, have had an even more profound impact on their attitude towards the police and other authority figures. And this issue is beautifully summarised, I think, by the following quote from a young man that I interviewed uh, in Upper Hutt in 2018. And I will, I will um, not use all his language, right? But he said, quote, I can look after myself. I'm used to the bullshit that the pigs throw at me because of my convictions and my behaviour. But the worst thing now is seeing and hearing them start on the next ones, the young ones. They're baiting them. They're effing bullying them, unquote. This was one of many uh, similar quotes that I 
heard. I'm especially interested in the issue of racism and bias in the criminal justice system because of ongoing attempts by the police and other criminal justice agencies to block critical independent research into this issue. I'm aware, of course, that Costa, the, 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 the um, police commissioner, has re recently announced an independent research into, not, not racism, so they won't use the R word, points of potential bias in policing practice. That's not a bloody well independent thing. Yes, Sir Kim Workman, who we all, uh, and I have a lot of respect for, is brought in to oversee it, yeah? But the MOU and the terms of reference have been written with the full authority of the police, and they have uh, asked the, I'm gonna get into trouble at work for this, the Crime Science and Security Unit at my own university to do the research, and they're funded by the police. That's not, in the, oh, well maybe I have a different, I'm naive and I have a different a definition of independent. Yeah, anyway, this current commissioner and the previous one, Mike Bush, it just seemed, they seem to have an inability to admit that racism exists in, their, in this institution, despite overwhelming evidence that it does. And they instead, uh, in my view, rely on meaningless semantics, such as the use of the term unconscious bias. Yeah, unconscious bias. For those of you who haven't heard that, that means that what Costa has said and Mike Bush before him said was that some people come into the police and they're not aware that they're biased against certain groups. Well, when I was stopped in 2006 walking down the road with my two mates, Scotty and Joe, to go to a pub in Wellington, all right, to have a beer and we're all suited up, and these two parkour cops stopped us and said, I want your ID. And I turned around and said, for what reason? Because you have to have a reason. You have to suspect me, blah, blah, blah. And I went through my usual spiel. And he goes, and excuse my language, oh, you're one of those effing smart niggas, aren't you? That police officer was not unconsciously by, he was well a bloody aware <laughs> of his racism. And when you do research like I do in the sector, we hear these stories all the time. And that's, by the way, not the only time that I have been spoken to by police that way. Um, and you can imagine what a dialogue with me would be like with police, <laughs> because I know my rights. And as soon as you speak up for yourself and they think that they're losing or controlling authority over the conversation, then it gets personal. And it's never me that makes it personal or other Māori, right? Anyway, right? The commissioner, the current one, seems to think, you know, that there's an equivalence between the lack of focus that they've had on white the violence, uh, potential violence of white supremacists, right? And his officers stopping and harassing Rangatahi for simply walking while brown. Or standing while brown outside a shop in Whanganui, as two young Rangatahi were, while they were waiting for their kōro. Two cops walked past and what did they do? Where's the, where, where's the bag? Where's the money you stole? We, there, there's been a robbery. We suspect bullshit. Bullshit. If these kids had actually, if they thought that there's any minute evidence that these two young Rangatahi had committed an offence, they wouldn't have stood there, took their, took their um, um, sorry, I'm getting a bit emotional, but this really angers me, took their uh, um, information and then took a photo of them and walked off. They would have arrested them. All right? This has been happening all through New Zealand, as you may be aware. Okay? Havelock North, Masterton, stopping young, um, young rangatahi to gather the information, threatening them to take their photos. We'll arrest you. Nonsense. They have no legal right to do that. They have a legal right like we do to take photos and film in public. But to go up and then threaten our rangatahi so that, to, to, with, uh, with an aggressive act like arrest so they could take their photo. Why are they taking their photo? Because they have a lovely new app and they could do an incident report, flick it through and it goes into a national database. And they are, and they are focusing, racially profiling our children. All right, sorry, yeah. I'm gonna do my own research on it. Hopefully Kim won't mind that I'm gonna do my own on this, yeah. So anyway, okay, so what are we gonna do? What should we do all about this? And this is what I'll finish on. What should we do? What can we do? And I have some suggestions. And not many of them will be very popular. If we want to do something about the social harm that's perpetrated by the criminal justice system against our whanau, 
then we need to do a number of things. And the first thing that we need to do in New Zealand is depoliticise crime control policy development in this country. We need to do what, for example, Finland has attempted to do over the last 30 years. Right? Put a stop to the impact of political ideology and grandstanding okay, on the development of crime control policy. We need uh, a cross-party agreement to stop this immature nonsense that we have to suffer through every three years as we go into the, um, the uh, election cycle where politicians, mainly male politicians, try to out-macho each other to see who can be tougher on crime, resulting in arguments for, and sometimes actually uh, resulting in significant increases in police with the usual unrealised and unrealistic promises of a reduction in crime and enhancement of our safety. We've been, in, we've been increasing the police force for decades now, and, and have you seen the crime rates go down? No. Okay. Because, as a criminologist, I can tell you, getting all theoretical, that often the op opposite happens. More police. S police strategy is, let's focus on the naughty um, communities, i.e. the brown ones. More police patrolling those communities. Okay, yes, they are there, and they will be able to deal with, for example, domestic violence in that year. But they also, through the, their, the aggressive nature of their policing strategies, will result in more arrests that result from conflict in the dialogue between Māori and them, yeah? If you have an aggressive policing culture, which we do, and you have more police policing our, our poor communities, particularly like in Mangare and what have you, you will have more arrests for what we call the trifecta. Uh, offensive language, although that's not so much of an issue these days, right, in terms of the uh, law. Resist, uh, resisting arrests and assault officer. And the trifecta, as we call it, often happens, and when you speak to the officers, they'll say, yeah, we just wanted to have a chat, and then they got all ho-ha with us. Why? Because the young Ma you speak to the young Māori, and he goes, well, he, I said, what are you bloody stopping me for? I just want to have a chat. Don't want to chat for you. Walk away. And that's when the aggression, the aggressive policing takes place, all right? This has been the, the tougher on crime approach has been the standard political response to the Māori represent, represent, representation issue for the past three decades, and I would argue has not made us safer. It has not made it has not been made a more effective, for a more effective criminal justice system. The way forward is to develop a policy process that is based on the needs of the community, and one less concerned with the needs or the re-election needs and egos of politicians. <laughs> Secondly. Get over the policy cringe and empower the community. Those who work with offenders and victims, etc., invariably know what is required, okay, for us to be able to respond meaningfully to that behaviour. We need a policy sector to work with us more directly and respectfully as partners to develop effective socially grounded solutions, yeah? But in order to do so, the policy sector needs to move away from a particular affliction that it suffers from. And I call it policy cringe. You know, cultural cringe, it's things are better elsewhere. We're continuously looking overseas for to import crime and control policies. And guess what jurisdictions we import them from? High crime ones. United States, Australia, Great Britain. Now I'm a criminologist, I'm sitting there going, well, why don't you go to Finland and Sweden and what have you, or other countries that have low crime rates? Maybe they have, you know. But then again, maybe you should actually look here first and look at what we're doing. I'll give you an example very quickly. In 2006, they, uh, there was a new English uh, general manager in justice who went a meeting with TPK and said, we've got this wonderful new program that we want to import from Bristol, where I worked, called Hot Families, in which we identify the, the crime-prone families that have a whole range of social issues. We got all the agencies involved and we go in there and we say, we're going to work with you. So that sounds familiar. Okay, carry on. And they said, however, if they don't take up that offer, then they're going to be, the police are going to be all over them. I went, great, the stick. And I turned around and said, you do realise, uh, you idiots, that you're actually already um, um, providing a little bit of putia for a, a, a programme in South Auckland that does exactly this, but without you know, the threat and they looked at me and went, do we? I went, yeah, 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 you, you, you know. 
So why are you looking to Bristol to import this draconian, aggressive policy when you already have a one based on tikanga? Oh, how do we know it works? I don't know, man, because they've told me that they are inundated. The police and corrections are ringing them day and night. Can you work with this family? Can you work with this family? If they weren't doing good mahi, then... All right? Three, I'm almost finished. Treatment and social support, not criminalisation and imprisonment. There is a simple way for the government to um, meet its projected uh, uh, objective of a 30% reduction in the prison muster. Stop sending people to prison. Stop arresting people and charging them, sending them to court for victimless crimes, some drug offences. Stop sending people to prison who are addicted or mentally unwell because the prison is not a therapeutic environment. Let's significantly increase our reliance and focus on therapeutic jurisprudence yeah, and treatment. Here's a suggestion that might annoy some people. Right? Recognise the reality of who we are dealing with in regards to our prison muster. A significant number of them are addicted, are mentally unwell for various reasons, and especially for, for a female woman in prison, long histories of trauma caused to them by their partners, domestic and sexual victimisation, which largely goes untreated. And in fact, if the stories are to be uh, uh, believed of what's happening in some Auckland women's prison, okay, are even committed by the guards. If we want to stop them from victimising others, we need to deal with their trauma and we deal with it in a meaningful way. In community, tikanga-based programs. And if you want evidence of the sorts of victimisation and trauma in people's past that has had a profound impact on the prison muster, then read Dr Liz Stanley's wonderful publication from 2016, The Road to Hell, State Violence Against Children in Post-War New Zealand. If you look at the data, those Māori boys in particular, and girls, but mainly the boys that were, that were forced into the borstals in the 50s through to the 70s, and you hear their harrowing stories of sexual violent victimisation by both guards and other inmates, they made up the majority of that cohort of young Māori men that, that resulted in reaching 50% of the prison muster in 1980. The state is culpable and needs to be held to account. And the last thing I'll talk about is this. The crime control sector, sector needs to let go. It needs to let us in. This is personal. This is a very personal, selfish thing. It needs to grow up. It needs to stop being so risk adverse and allow independent researchers like myself and others to come in and critically analyse the co their conduct. The principal crime control agencies in this country have for too long now been making it very difficult for external scrutiny of, of their business. Okay. In fact, a few years ago, uh, even though he's not Māori, Jared Gilbert, some of you might know Jared Gilbert, did his PhD on, on gangs and is an expert in gangs. Him and his group tried to get uh, asked for, uh, um, access to some data the police had to do research, and the police uh, said no, blocked him, deeming him a risk because of his gang associations. He did his bloody research on, on gangs. <laughs> so I wrote a blog in support from the Indigenous criminologist saying, well, I'm stuffed because I worked with a, gang, a lifelong gang member, Harry Tam. I have two cousins in the mob in Batoni and three in the Black Power, and I drink with them at family dues. I have worked and done policy work with them, so I'm an associate. This is ridiculous, right? Any excuse, right? Let me be, I want to finish on the following. Let me be frank with you, even more frank than I have been. <laughs> policy, yeah. Now I'm going to be frank. That was the warm-up. The policy workers and the, and the government and government agencies do not always have the answers, right? More importantly, because they are so close to their own work, they sometimes cannot see the wood for the trees. In other words, it's sometimes very difficult for them to step back, you know, and critically analyse the impact of their work. Sometimes the questions the topics that us or the community have, okay, are the right ones to be asking. The government agencies, including police, corrections, Oranga Tamariki, Ministry of Justice, they have to remember that they are in fact part of the public service. They get their resources in Putia from the public purse. They are answerable to us. They should step aside and allow us to critically scrutinise and analyse their business 
And if they're more, I think if they are more mature about this process, then together I think that we might be able to develop more effective uh, programs and processes. But, um, but if they're going to be effective, they have to be ones that support Māori self-determination. Thank you very much for your time. I don't think anyone's worried that you've gone over time. Sorry. Um, I've got a whole lot of notes that I, I can't really read, so I'm going to try and, and um, do justice to what we've just heard, no pun intended. Um, look, I, I think you know the points that you've raised are ones that we do all recognise and know about. Um, you know, you talked about catastrophic failure, and I don't think we can we can say anything less than that in terms of what the justice system has done for our people. Um, Oranga Tamariki, you know, Māori name, but what has that done for our, our Tamariki? Um, you know, we need to look at how we can make these changes. I think the other thing that you have talked about today, one, is the importance of our own people doing our own research um, and the difference that that makes in terms of the lens that comes across that. Um, it is bullshit, sorry, but um, you know, it, it, it is what it is. Um, you know, you talked about the photos. I, I remember hearing Andy Costa say um, that they were taking those photos and the justification for that was relating it to the gathering of evidence in relation to terrorism. This is just another form of gathering evidence. What kind of evidence, on what basis, and our uh, rangatahi. So, uh, you know, I think you're absolutely right, and I'm pleased that you've used, I'm not going to call it the R word, actually racism. Let's put it where it is, let's put it where it lies, and let's keep using that, because we need to get that message across. That's what has to change. And I think you've highlighted the need for that um, in your quarter all today. Um, I think that, um, you know, I, I just want to finish on a couple of points. One is that, um, you know, you talked about empowering communities and, you know, that's what Fano Order is. It is about empowering the community. Um, and to end, I just want to say it is, it is clear that the research shows that if it is so good, then why is the policy so bad? Kilda. Thank you very much.